Good evening. I hope that you've had a good day today. We close out our study tonight on the book of Philippians. Appreciate John and Eric's uh, work to help us stay busy studying the scripture while we're uh, separated and under the uh, present distress. Our next study, beginning next week, will be in the book of Colossians, and uh, we'll begin chapter 1 uh, next week. There's been a good response from uh, all, several of you in, on our study in chapter 4, and again, uh, this week I had some good uh, comments that were sent in, and I want to read some of them here before we get started. Uh, one writes, I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. That stands out to me because Paul has been through so much conflict, persecution, and was in prison at the time. I find my sufferings in this life to be much less dramatic than Paul's, what Paul experienced, and yet I've struggled in finding contentment in hard circumstances. Uh, but verse 13 gives us the key to finding that contentment regardless of the circumstances. It must come through Christ who strengthens us. Another writes, this is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. It is my go-to for so many things. I read something different in these verses every time. I focused on verse 7 as of late. God gives us peace in so many ways, so we ask him for that. Uh, this peace is what guards our heart, and with this peace we can live out uh, verse 4 and find joy in all things. And it's with this peace we can uh, worry less in verse 6. And with this peace, we can trust and be content, as stated in verse 11. I pray for this peace daily, that I will let God rule my life with this peace. Another comment uh, is, we've all heard the old saying, you are what you eat. I believe that's what verses 8 and 9 are telling us about ourselves in a mental and spiritual sense. If we uh, constantly search for the good, positive, optimistic uh, aspects of uh, life uh, to think about. We will find ourselves feeling good, positive, and optimistic. We should also follow the example of Paul as he lived out his life uh, dedicated to the service to God. If we deal in negativity and bad news or sinful thoughts uh, and imitate worldly people, we'll find ourselves removed from God, his peace, and his blessings. If we meditate on true, honorable, just, pure, holy, uh, love, lovely, commendable, excellent, praiseworthy things and follow the example of godly people, we will find that we were always grateful, uh, content and at peace in any situation that life uh, might present itself. Uh, another comment was uh, sent in and says, I thought a lot about verses 6 and 7 as I read this chapter this morning when we talked about the same uh, when we talked about this some tonight in our Bible study, we generally don't have any issue asking God for the things that we need or even want. We don't hesitate to pray for others when they are sick or hurting. But how often do we truly uh, are we truly thankful to God for answered prayers? How often are we truly thankful for what God has blessed us with in our lives? We do need to pray to God knowing that he can do more than we can ever ask him. But let's remember to praise him and thank him for all that he does. Never lose sight that we can all we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Another uh, comment was verses 6 and 7 have always been some of my favorite verses. Being a worrier by nature, I find peace in this form of how to overcome my worry. We're so blessed spending time thanking the Lord, thanking the Lord for the multitude of blessings we have e that we have uh, eases our mind and gives us a peace that people of the world seldom understand. What a great way that we can shine our light and bring others to Christ. If we have peace in the dark times, what a great example we can be. And finally, uh, one comments, reminders for us of things to work on from chapter four. Peace that passes understanding, guarding our hearts and minds, be content in whatever state we're in. Rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, verses 6 and 7 seem to be uh, very popular. The message there, I think, is not only important, but very comforting. Uh, let's begin uh, looking at verse 3 here in chapter 4. Uh, 
Paul says, and I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are are in the book of life. Uh, Paul makes an interesting reference here to the book of life. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting subject. Throughout the Bible, there are references to God's book. Uh, John refers to this book several times in his writing of uh, Revelation. In chapter 3 and verse 5, he says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father, before the, his angels. In chapter 13 and verse 8, he writes, All who dwell on earth will worship him. That's the beast there in verse 1, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And the Bible tells us that uh, those that are written in this book are a very exclusive group of names. In Psalm 69 and verse 28, the psalmist writes, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 16, then those who feared the Lord and spoke to one another and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditate on his name. In Exodus chapter 32, beginning at verse 32, God, uh, Moses speaking to God says, Yet now, if you will forgive their sins, but I, if not, I pray, blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. What these few scriptures teach us is that only the names of those who are righteous are in God's book. Only those who fear the Lord and meditate on his name, only those who have not sinned against God, simply meaning those whose sins have been forgiven. And it's obviously that we want our names written in that book because only those whose names are found there uh, will be allowed in heaven. John tells us that the book of life will be a part of the final judgment. Uh, in Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11, John writes, Then I saw the great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades were delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Uh, books that we were judged by are obviously those standards that God has revealed to man. Uh, mankind since the time of Jesus will, of course, be judged by the gospel of Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 12 and verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken to you, him will judge him in the last day. But then notice how man will be judged, not according to their faith only, but according to their works. This really flies into the face of those who contend that a sinner is saved uh, whenever uh, he or she believes but not after repenting, confessing, and being baptized and living faithfully before the Lord all of their life. And it means those who are written in the book of life are those who have been obedient to the commands of Jesus, not just to those who believe in Jesus. Speaking of the New Jerusalem, which is heaven, John wrote in Revelation 21 at verse 27, but there shall by, there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Let's continue reading there at verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Paul lays out some instructions here. I believe that point to a conclusion that he states there in verse 7. Uh, 
that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice those instructions are to rejoice in the Lord always, to be show our gentleness to those around us, uh, not to be anxious, but to pray with supplication and thanksgiving. Paul returns here to one of the major themes of his letter, and that is joy in the Lord. The church at Philippi was in danger of discouragement, despair, and disunity. All of these things have negative effects on the attitude of God's people. We can become so negative in our outlook on life that, and uh, even our spiritual life that we can lose our faith. So Paul reminds us to rejoice in the Lord. And the reason that we can and should rejoice in the Lord always is because we have all the spiritual blessings that are afforded us in Christ Jesus. As Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 1 at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You see, we have uh, Christ in us and with us. We have Christ on our side protecting and providing for us, mediating for us, interceding for us. All of these blessings are reasons for rejoicing, even if uh, the external circumstances of our life are less than perfect, uh, specifically in, in this, today's present distress, uh, when we're confused and sometimes uh, anxious about what might happen uh, because of the confusion in society. But we can rejoice. And we know that because uh, Paul gives us an example of that in Acts chapter 16, when uh, he and Silas visited Philippi and uh, converted those Christians there. The account of them being in prison uh, was just an example of how that when things are going bad, we can, you know, we can find things to rejoice in. Beginning at verse 24, chapter 16, Luke wrote, Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison, fastened their feet in stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. You know, after being beaten and unjustly imprisoned, uh, Paul and Silas found reason to rejoice. And while Paul was enduring this distress uh, in Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 14, being imprisoned in Rome, Paul had reason to rejoice in the Lord, according to verse 10. And the fact of the matter is, if we're going through life only looking at the negative things around us, we will be miserable. But when we make an effort to look at the positive blessings that fill our lives, we will enjoy the true happiness that comes from serving Jesus. Too often we're depressed about life rather than uh, being joyful about our salvation. More of us complain about life uh, rather than give thanks for God's blessing. And too often the saddest people in our community are those who are calling themselves Christians. Think about all of the positive things that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi about. Uh, he talked about his, uh, uh, his imprisonment and said that there was uh, a positive result of that. He gave a positive report about his imprisonment, talking about how that uh, the gospel had spread uh, in that city. He encouraged them about his outlook on life and death. He reminded them that their true citizenship was in heaven. He told them that they were able to work out their own salvation and show themselves lights to the perverse generation that they lived in and among. He informed them that they were able to press on to spiritual maturity so that they could win the crown of eternal life. And he promised them that they could be transformed into the glory of Jesus if they remain faithful to the gospel. These are all things that we can gain a positive, joyful attitude about uh, at any time in our life, when things are good or even when things might be troubled. So the instruction to rejoice in the Lord always are not just so many words, but uh, positive instructions for us to follow as we live our life. Paul goes on to say, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Paul tells us that not only are we to demonstrate our joy in the Lord, but we people must be seeing uh, in our living our mild and reasonable nature as we deal with others. And this, of course, uh, ties to Paul's appeal in chapter 2, where he uh 
admonish the Christians not to live a selfish life, do things by uh, because of selfishness, but uh, show a willingness to be uh, compassionate towards others, putting other people before ourselves. And obviously this is difficult when we're surrounded by uh, so many people in the world that are rude and thoughtless, but we have help that those outside of Christ do not have. Paul says the Lord is at hand. And this statement means just about the same thing as verse 13 means, where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The psalmist wrote in Psalms 145 at verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. You see, with the help of Christ, we can demonstrate a righteous life and a contented, gentle attitude, even when others are not gentle and thoughtful towards us. He says, be anxious for nothing. Uh, you know, Christians do not simply live for the future. We don't live anxiously waiting in a cave for an imminent return of the Lord. We live our lives in view of what the future holds for us. Jesus' coming promises an end to all suffering, and uh, the promise of an eternal reward away from all pain and suffering. But we have to live in time. We cannot escape the world until, in fact, we leave it in death or when Christ returns. So our lives must reflect our attitude about the Lord's coming and the promised reward that we look forward to. But also we must reflect the fact that the Lord is near, that he is close at hand, to help us in times of need, which means there should be no undue concern about the things that pertain to this present life. But being ancient for nothing isn't an easy task, and the reason is, is this life is all that we know, and we're closely connected to all matters of the life that we live. And it's difficult at times to disconnect ourselves from our physical needs or the relationships that we enjoy in life, to the point of not worrying about them. The point that Paul is making us is that we're not to be overly concerned with the matters of life. We most certainly have a responsibility of taking care of ourselves and our families. We're to love them and provide for them. And all of these things require thoughtfulness and concern. But the pursuit uh, of physical matters and relationships can overshadow our relationship with Jesus if we allow it. And the hope that we have for better things beyond this life can be diminished if we allow that. Uh, Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 6 at verse 33, when he was talking about being concerned about uh, physical things, he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. You know, this really ought to be our motto in life. If our lives are filled with constant communication with God and gratitude for his blessings, if we fill our lives with gentle concern for others, if we're devoted to following the example of Jesus and his instructions, it is possible to keep our minds on the main thing that life is all about. And of course, then Paul concludes the, the thoughts with, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. One writer defined this peace as a deep tranquility of soul resting wholly upon God. Tranquility is defined as the state of being free from agitation. So we could say that the peace of God is freedom from the agitation of the guilt and sorrow that's caused by sin. Freedom from the agitation of materialism and the worry about the things of this life, physical things of this life. Freedom from the agitation of relationships, especially those relationships that are troubling. Freedom from the fear of the unknown. See, Paul assures us, as Jesus did, that we can have trouble-free hearts if we believe in him, follow his commands. If we empty our minds of worry and sinfulness, and fill our minds with wholesome, righteous thoughts. This is what Paul speaks to beginning in verse 8 of chapter 4. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, 
there's any virtue, if there's any praise, anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. See, Paul ends his admonition of this high standard of thinking uh, by, you know, following his example, setting our minds on things that are above rather than our things that are below, filling our minds with wholesome and righteous thoughts. Uh, is connected to Paul's admonition there in chapter 3 when he tells Christians to press on to the upward call of God. Uh, spiritual maturity comes only when a person controls his thinking and submits to the authority of God. Filling our minds with these good and righteous thoughts adds to that peace that we shall seek and is found only in God. We pray that the rest of your week will be a good week. We pray that our uh, leaders of our land will come to some conclusions so we will be able to soon return to our uh, further and uh, normal walks of life. Uh, we pray that the Lord will bless you uh, during this week.